welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Jacob Nicely, the Director of Marketing for Vanderbilt Athletics. Today, we are going to discuss college athletics marketing preparation before promotion. Let's get to it. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. Of course, happy to be here. Thanks for uh, having me. You bet. I, you have quite the history of being involved in athletics marketing at a number of collegiate institutions, which includes James Madison University, University of Georgia, Clemson, University of Maryland, and now at Vanderbilt University. So talk to me, what are some of the key differences in athletics marketing between these universities? Yeah, um, there's a fair amount of of differences. I'd say generally it's it's about the same uh, from place to place, but just depending on the the conferences and kind of the institutional uh, setup of it, um, a major difference between uh, my current role now and previous institutions is that this is my first time working at a private university uh, as opposed to a state university. So there's quite a bit of uh, differences and uh, policies and different hoops and and things to to go through uh, working at a private university uh, than a public one. Uh, But for the most part, we're primarily focused on serving our student athletes, our alumni and our our fans. uh, And all those institutions have had diehard Fans and uh, just makes my job a little more fun uh, trying to pack our stadiums and support our student athletes. What about the sports that were popular at the different programs? Are there certain sports that are that are more preferred by the community and the student body? Oh, for sure. Uh, I'd say each place I've been to, I've had unique sports to uh, at Georgia. One of my sports was equestrian, which is a emerging sport for NCAA. Uh, Vanderbilt, I have bowling, uh, but regionally uh, been a very big difference. Uh, at Maryland, I had men's lacrosse, which lacrosse is a huge deal uh, in the Northeast and especially in that Maryland region. Um, it was a huge fan favorite and student favorite. And it's a sport that uh, even though I only grew up about four hours away from there in Virginia, we didn't have growing up. So it was kind of a, a little bit of a learning curve for me. Uh, on that one. Um, but yeah, like it, it was kind of interesting of each school has a different passion. Uh, Vanderbilt, our fans are really diehard, uh, but I'd say our, our baseball program is probably the most well-known nationally profile-wise. Uh, like I said, Maryland, really known for for their basketball program historically. Clemson's football program um, has been a powerhouse recently. So each school kind of has their own little different uh, powerhouse uh, sports, but been thankful to, to work with some national championship caliber teams uh, everywhere I've been. So that's been awesome. That is amazing. And how do how did the different sports change your approach to athletics marketing? Oh, uh, I think just each target demographic is so different with each sport um, that you work with and kind of the fan base of it. Um, like. For instance, being in Maryland, you're in a really heavy pro sports market um, working there. So the way that you're targeting fans and trying to get new fans in is completely different than being at Clemson and being in a college town environment uh, where it's really just Clemson and South Carolina if you grow up in the state uh, of who you're a fan of. Um, So just kind of what that fan base and alumni base kind of like looks like and kind of how you go after them as well as new fans is just a little bit different um, based on kind of like the market share of each one. Um, It's just very unique. Uh, And Nashville's kind of a little bit of a hybrid of both. Um, We're the only power five school um, here in Nashville being at Vanderbilt, but we also are competing with pro sports teams of we have the Predators and the Titans in Nashville SC here in town too. Um, So it's a little more unique than when I was at Maryland, but still kind of the same situation, but definitely changes from college towns to big cities to pro sports towns. Um, very different. Yeah. Well, you brought up a really good point that there's a lot of competition for entertainment options, both in sports and I mean, Nashville is really known for, for music as well. And, and how do you compete in that space? 
Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Really, it's just trying to to make sure that our product is as good as our competition. And um, thankfully, here we're not really as competing with um, as many Power Five schools, but we do have a couple uh, local Division One schools uh, here in Belmont and Lipscomb that we're competing with. But in sort of regards to pro teams and concerts and everything else going on in Nashville, uh, we just try and make our in venue experience match that expectation of what um, our fans expect to go out and see in the community um, of just trying to put on a production level that matches the the entertainment value, um, which has been a, a learning curve, but uh, getting better at it for sure and, and trying to, to bring that wow factor. And does your budget match those of who you're competing against in the community? Uh, for pro teams, I'd probably say not quite. Uh, <laughs> not quite the, the same ballpark. I kind of wish I had the, the pyro budgets of uh, the Titans and Nashville SC and the Predators. Uh, but we're we're definitely getting creative uh, and trying to to find new ways to to kind of bring that same value just within a reasonable price budget. <laughs> within a reasonable price point, yes, absolutely. And and talk to me post COVID. How have you? How has competing for this entertainment changed, or has it stayed the same? Oh, it's, it's changed a lot. Um, and it kind of during that that time period, uh, transition from Maryland to, to Vanderbilt. But um, this past season for us was the first season that we haven't had COVID attendance protocols in place uh, for, for men's basketball. Um, we had vaccination cards um, or proof of vaccination last season. Um, so this year is kind of the first one. So really, like in that change from pre-COVID to now, I think a lot of people reevaluated where they're spending their time and their entertainment dollars on. Um, and we saw a decrease in our season tickets um, from our last season pre-COVID um, to our 21-22 season uh, of our first season with uh, fans back uh, prior to that. So it has been a challenge, but really just trying to focus on is the product we're putting in the arena worth getting up off of your couch to, to go experience? And is it at a price point that makes sense so um it has been a challenge but that's why i'm in this job i like that that part of things so it's it's been fun to figure out and we've been increasing our attendance numbers uh, in the right direction so things are going well so tell me about some of the the marketing strategies that you're using like in regards to promotions and um entertainment at halftime things like that like talk, talk to me about some of those strategies and how do you make that happen yeah, 100 percent. So um, we have just started going out one of, of just making sure our, our price points and our ticketing offers are where they should be um, and, and trying to make sure that we're spending our marketing dollars wisely um, through digital ads, uh, through search um, advertising, through uh, our email marketing efforts, um, traditional advertising and just trying to get around the community of like, hey, come out to our games. It's affordable. It's fun. It's a good time. And even with that, of just the NVNU experience, we this past season for men's basketball started adding in uh, halftime singer songwriter concert series because we're in Nashville, right? And that's what you, you come to Nashville for um, and trying to just do those unique things that you might not get at other venues and adding in smoke off the goals, and fun giveaway items like cowboy hats and uh, just trying to get our, our student population out because they kind of really enhance our game atmosphere. And if they're there and they're loud and they're rowdy, um, it's really going to bleed to our, our other fans um, and kind of get them excited and, and pumped up and create a really good environment. That's helpful for me to sell to, to new fans that are thinking about coming out to games. And what percentage of uh, attendees are students versus people from the community? Uh, it really depends on the game. Uh, for a lot of our bigger attendance, attended games, uh, I'd say it's usually about 15 to 20 percent of, of our attendance are, are students. Um, our last regular season home game of the year, uh, we had a little over 10,000 people for our Mississippi State game, and we had about 2,200 students, which is about 17 percent of our entire student population <laughs> was at the game, which is a really good number for us. Um, and like I said, when, when they come out, it's a it's a rowdy environment. They're very, probably very passionate about cheering for the their home team. 100%. <laughs>
So do you bring some of these students or, or fans onto the um, court or the field for, for promotional activities? Yes, all the time, uh, whether sponsor or we're just looking to fill some of some entertainment uh, portions of our game production. Uh, we'll definitely get the, the crowd and the fans involved and students. Well, talk to me a little bit about how, what are your strategies for protecting the, those people and protecting the university? If there's a slip and fall, I see if someone gets hurt. How do you kind of prevent that from happening? Yeah, absolutely. So we work with a, a couple different areas um, on that. So we have uh, waivers um, that we work with our campus legal team uh, on to provide to make sure that um, everyone knows what they're participating and kind of knows what to expect and up front. Um, so we make all of our participants for, for on court uh, promotions, uh, look over those waivers, review them and then sign them. Um, and then as well, like we work with our uh, facilities team to like make sure that the, the courts are cleaned and that um, we are kind of operating what makes sense. Like our court, for instance, is raised. We have a very unique court here at Vanderbilt. Um, and if you could potentially, if you go too far off the one side or the other could fall off. So we make sure that we're staying away from team huddles when we're doing these promotions and um, make sure we're staying away from the edges of the court uh, and also making sure that they're safe and fun for the participant making sure that we're not putting somebody into a, a situation that could be super risky um or something that they don't want to do does this mean you just choose to work with adults when you're doing these promotional activities uh, yeah a lot of times uh, yes <laughs> a lot of times uh we'll work with adults now we work, we'll do kids promotions on some things like we'll do like a little kids dunk where they have a little basketball and they'll do a dunk on a goal uh, but for the most part, anything that involves a lot of dribbling or shooting or running, uh, we'll try and stick to 18 and up. And kind of our um, NCAA guidance and compliance kind of dictate some of that. Um, we usually don't get to work with what is considered prospective student athletes um, for these promotions. So a lot of times high schoolers are um, out of the question for a lot of these promotions on that side of things. Um, so really, it's just either going with kids or going with adults. And a lot of times, obviously, with kids, you just work with the parents on getting their permission and reviewing the waivers um, prior to the kid participating in the promotion. But usually we'll stick to adults for the most part. That's interesting. So do you have to are you guessing whether or not they kind of fit that high school profile or do you ask? <laughs> yes. So so usually sometimes we'll we'll try we'll uh we'll ask. We're we're get a little bit of uh leeway on um if it's reasonable for us to expect that they're not like most of the time we're just randomly picking fans out of the crowd uh to, to participate. So most of the time, like we know where the students sit in our student section, so we're pretty safe going there. Um, but occasionally if if we feel like it's a question or not, um we will ask to clarify, hey, are you what grade are you or what high school are you uh, attend or things like that, just to try and uh, be on the safe side. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Don't want to ruin any eligibility issues. So um, it, talk to me about music. Music is a big part of for the promotional experience and, and making a game lively. So um, what kind of licenses do you have to play music in in the different facilities? Yeah, so um, our campus legal team and university, thankfully, uh, handles uh, most of that side of things. But the the big uh, players in this industry, ASCAP and, and BMI, um, which both have offices uh, here in Nashville, <laughs> um, are the the main uh, licensors for when it comes to to music and and songwriting stuff. So. Um, we work with them and then also uh, work with a DJ at our men's basketball games uh, who is also covered underneath those licenses um, and goes through the, the right process of, of getting music to, to play in venue uh, to make sure that we're, we're covered from those areas. Because as you said, music is a huge piece of the game experience. Fans want to come and hear well-known music and uh, common things it's hard to get people excited off of songs they haven't really ever heard before <laughs> and especially when it comes to the to our team and their warm-ups and they have specific artists and songs that they want to to hear and listen to um so making sure that we're we're able to kind of 
play those things in venue for them is important. So if you're having a live performance where an entertainer is coming in and they're performing music and you have also um, TV recording, uh, filming the, the game and maybe capturing some of the footage of the performers, um, how does that work with getting permission to broadcast or you know, how do you resolve those issues regarding copyright? Yeah, so really that's when we have those type of things, is it's really just getting clearance from the label for the recording artists. Um, sometimes we're lucky enough to have artists that are uh, independent that work on their own that don't have quite as many hurdles when dealing with music. Um, but sometimes we have artists that obviously are assigned to record labels. Um, so a lot of times it's just reaching out to them directly um, and our radio broadcast um, and play by play guy. Uh, Andrew has done a really good job of kind of working with campus to kind of get um, rights to or at least a kind of form put together uh, to be able to use um, some artist music on our, our football broadcasts um, and men's basketball broadcasts. So um, we at least have a little bit of a template that when we go to, to these artists and reach out to them, we can kind of say, hey, there's a chance that your music could be used in X, Y, and Z or put on this whatever channel. Do you get permission to clear it? Um, and just kind of working with them to make sure that our bases are covered legally um, if we do want to use it in that manner. Yeah, lots of permission in advance and commu clear communication and, and contra and written language yes. and contracts, <laughs> things like that. A little overwhelming at first. Yeah, so no, I imagine I'm managing all that and making sure everybody signed off before you actually let the let the show go on is is probably pretty critical. You know, Vanderbilt has had some different trademarks for athletics and the university. Can you talk to me about how you're sort of working on rebranding and, and working on using more consistent trademarks across the board? Yeah, absolutely. So last March, uh, we debuted, or I should say March of 2022. Uh, I keep forgetting it's May now. Um, we uh, launched a new rebrand for our university and our athletic department kind of uniting both of those logos. Uh, so we had been using our Star V logo for quite some time um, at this point, but just to kind of nail home our radical collaboration that we've been uh, doing with campus and, and just being one entity, uh, we switched over our logos um, to the new V that we have. Um, so with that process has been kind of updating all of our old logos and um, throughout our venues and promotional products and giveaway items and website and everywhere you could think of bookstore etc um so with that um uh, we just work really closely with um danielle mellon who uh is oversees our licensing um for vanderbilt um and she comes from the athletic space which is really awesome for us um to to have that um background for her and being able to work uh with us on it of making sure that all of our vendors are up and aware of all of our new logos when we're ordering items and making sure going through the right approval process with her and through CLC um, to make sure that we're covering all of our bases when ordering merchandise to make sure that if there's royalties or not royalties involved um, or making sure certain vendors are only allowed to use certain marks, uh, whether some are only allowed to use apparel, some are only allowed to use prints, some are um, just different license types. Um, throughout that they they work with her on and then we end up working with a lot of those different vendors on uh, when we get bids for different items and, and promotions so um, it's just been something that we've been slowly working towards getting rid of all of our star v stuff um, and moving towards the the new logo um, so you'll have to ignore the star v that's still on my shirt but nike's a little <laughs> behind due to supply chain issues from covid but we're getting there <laughs> And it's not just the Vanderbilt trademark. Sometimes you have sponsors or partners that you may be using their marks as well. Um, I am sure there's a lot of contracts that really spell out how and when you can use those marks. Is that correct? Yep, 100%. And a lot of times, especially when we're working with uh, sponsors and, and outside entities, um, it'll go through a, a pretty lengthy or i should say in depth hopefully it's not lengthy sometimes it is lengthy approval process um on them when we're doing things like co-branded items 
um, or specific giveaway items, or even simply a lot of times just using their logo and venue of um, they each have preference within their brand guidelines of what color background certain logos should be on or what outline the text should be for for certain things or it needs to be displayed vertically when used in this format or horizontally in this format or all those different things um and it can get a little more complicated when it goes to to co-branded stuff um but we always usually find a way to get it done uh, for the most part and at this point once you're you're in it for a little while kind of figure out what the brand guidelines are and kind of get a feel for what the sponsor's going to be okay with. And a lot of times it's just going through a lot of proofs um, and making sure everyone's on the same page um, and everything looks correct from their branding standpoint and their trademarks um, yeah. when handing things out or using them on social or et cetera. And you have to take pictures and document kind of how that's used and Maybe yep. of 100% so a lot of times um, <laughs> fulfillment <laughs> <laughs> yes 100% excuse me um that will we'll show proof of them um being used a lot of times we'll save some extra items for the sponsors um if it's a t-shirt or a bobblehead or whatever um so that they'll physically have the item afterwards um in addition to the pictures of um their sponsored content or sponsored assets being run or handed out or whatever channel we're, we're executing it on. And advertising is something that you're also part of or, you know, have a <laughs> contribute to helping with the marketing efforts. What kind of advertising do you do when it comes to college athletics? Yeah, so we'll do, honestly, there's nothing off limits when it comes to, to advertising and, and what we'll do for the most part. Um, I'd say obviously within what we would consider standard for university um, and what's allowed within the NCAA um, or with our state. Um, so we won't do anything cra crazy um, in that sense. Like we're not advertising on betting apps or anything like that. Um, but outside of that, um, we're always trying to get creative. I mean, we're on every social platform pretty much that you could think of uh we still do traditional advertising like radio and billboards um search advertising um i'm even trying to think of, of, of some of the crazier <laughs> stuff potent we we just uh did a campaign where we just launched um we sent out i think thirty thousand postcards uh as part of our next door neighbor campaign of, of people that are new to nashville and trying to get them to adopt us as their new hometown team um as they're moving here so new old we're kind of all over the place on what works even if it's just sticking a table out at different farmers markets or events and handing out flyers um anything we can do to to drive attention to us and get people out to support our student athletes yeah that's really amazing and and you all had a, a, a you pivoted away from using ticketmaster for your ticketing platforms right can you tell us a little bit about the the reason for the change yeah so um ticketmaster is obviously widely used um within sports um and right now or i should say recently it's been in a little bit of uh, not hot water but in the public spotlight um for some of their decisions we kind of made ours prior to that of they just weren't quite meeting our needs and kind of what we were looking to to do um and we switched over to Packy Owen who is a uh leader kind of in the collegiate athletics ticketing space um and kind of solely focuses um on that side of things um so really it just comes down to what are our goals and what is our ticket provider providing and is the back end what we need is the front end facing the customer what they need is it providing a, a good experience for them and that's not saying that ticketmaster doesn't have some of those things um but for us um Pacquiao was just the the right decision um for us and the services they can provide us and the system and the way it just communicates uh with all of our platforms um via email, social backend, et cetera, um, for us. So it's still, we're still working out, I'd say through some kinks and trying out new features as we get more experience. We're, I guess, coming up on the July one, we'll be about a year into the new uh, agreement with Packy Owen. Um, but yeah, just kind of at the end of the day, it comes down to 
is it, are they meeting our needs? Um, and if we feel like another party can, can help us improve our efforts, we're, we're going to move that direction. Uh, yeah, that, that makes sense. So you got to find out that what's going to suit your, your needs the best. Um, NIL, name, image, and likeness has been a big deal. How has this shifted how you pursue promotions? Yeah, I 100% it has changed a lot of things. One, it, it changes kind of in venue the way we do things. We're in, uh, even on social media, we're promoting a lot more of our, our student athletes in the sense of tagging their profiles or doing collaborations with them on Instagram or um, including their social media handles on their headshot when they're up to bat at baseball uh, or announcing the starting lineup at, at men's basketball. Um, but it also kind of, yeah, changes the way that we we market things. Um, obviously, in the past, kind of NCA guidelines have kind of specified the way we kind of interact with student athletes and their images with sponsor logos, where now they're allowed to do that opportunity kind of on their own. Um, so we just try and be conscious of that balance of not taking away a potential NIL opportunity from them, but also still being able to to promote their events and their likeness and try and be a good partner in supporting our student athletes however we can and, and getting them the, the recognition they deserve and try to tote that line <laughs> between the two. The balancing act, now you have to consider other factors and in, in your decisions. And Vanderbilt is, is enrollment is just shy of 14,000 students who are enrolled at your university with different backgrounds and inclusion is something that a lot of universities are, are trying to embrace and, and be more mindful of. So how does collegiate athletic marketing working towards being more inclusive? Oh yeah, 100%. I mean, it's what we live in a world obviously where DEI is an important piece of it as it should be. Um, and for us, it's trying to reach out to, to new folks that might not have considered being a fan or, or coming to our, our sporting events. Um, and some of our coaches have been good partners in it. We have our head men's basketball coach, Jerry Stackhouse, uh, was a member of a Divine Nine fraternity. And something that's big for him is scheduling non-conference games with HBCUs. So it's been fun for, for me to work on Divine Nine nights and National Panhellenic nights with some of our Black fraternities and sororities on, on campus um and just trying different efforts um through things and we came off a, a big 50-year title IX campaign last season uh, throughout our, our women's sports programs here so for me it's just a new hopefully more exciting way to get people involved with us um on our sporting events and, and just being a part of our community and our university which really embraces dei and uh, for us, I think that's just something that we want to continue to build upon going forward. Yeah. So the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities, and then, of course, Title IX is, has to do with um, more gender equity in athletics. So those are two great things that kind of highlight your efforts towards inclusion. Well, Jacob, I thank you so much for your time today. And thanks for talking to us about uh, college athletics marketing and the preparation before promotion. So thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. We will see you next time on the Sports Playbook. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.